Hey everyone, it's George Carlson. and welcome to the July highlights portion of the Innovators Mindset podcast. And for many of my friends in North America and parts of the world, I know you're on break and you probably miss a lot of the episodes. So this is a great way to catch up. And I know that many of our educator friends on the other side of the world are in school and I hope you're doing okay. I hope everything is going well. I know uh, some schools are having lockdowns because of COVID still and my thoughts are all with you and I hope you're doing okay. And hopefully we can bring some joy, some ideas, some, uh, you know, uh, happy conversations through this. And, uh, and uh, this is one of the reasons I love doing this podcast so much. And we have some really great guests, but I wanted to share a quick story for you before we get into the podcast. Uh, something that I think about, and as you're kind of going into the year, I, I remember when I first started teaching, I spent, <laughs> some of you might have heard this story, uh, I spent a lot of time crying when I would come home. I was exhausted, and sometimes students would, you know, we would have, uh, you know, some behavioral things happening. And I took it really personally. I thought, I'm a horrible teacher, you know, like, how come these kids don't like me? And I would say that I felt that way too often in my first couple of years of education. And I remember there was a speaker who came to our school district and he said something really that stuck out to me. And it, you have those moments where you hear something that one person says in one moment and it sticks with you forever. And I don't remember anything about his talk, but I do remember him saying this, don't let an eight year old ruin your day. And when I thought about it, I kind of laughed and thought, oh, that's kind of ridiculous. And then I realized I was the person, you know, letting kids ruin my day. And it's not because they were trying to ruin my day. And it's not because I didn't care about the kids. I actually really did care about the kids, but I took a lot of things personally. And sometimes the behavioral issues, they weren't because of the student having an issue with me. They were having another issue with something else. And I think a lot of times I took it personally. I took it that it was against me. And I'm not saying don't care about your kids. I'm not saying don't love them, your students with all your heart. I think that's awesome that we do that. But I understand sometimes, you know, as you're going into this year, uh, as you're going into this space, sometimes the issue that the student seems to have with you is not with you. And the reason why you struggle sometimes is because you do care. And that's something that you have to really understand. And that one moment really changed my perspective and made me think different about, you know, working with students and how I took things personally and how I could, you know, deal with students, help them as much as I can, but not worry about personally if they were, if it was a conflict between you and I, and I'm not saying I never did have, you know, didn't do anything wrong as a teacher. I uh, didn't have any behavioral issues because of, you know, something that I might've done, you know, as a student and as a teacher. But that advice of don't let an eight-year-old ruin your day was something that stuck out to me, was something that I thought about quite a bit. And it made the teaching for me a lot more relaxing. It made being an administrator more relaxing and take that time to enjoy it. So I just want to share that story as many of us are going into a new school year because I know all of you listening are spending your time, own time, because you care about kids. And I know that that shines through in your classrooms, it shines through in your schools, and that we take things sometimes very personally. I know I used to for a long time, and I think we're all doing our best, but I just want to thank you for all that you do, how much I appreciate you, and I hope you enjoy listening to our, our awesome guests. I want to share these little short stories uh, before these introductions, but I hope you enjoy uh, my, the guest, I probably ruined it with my story, probably scared a bunch away, but welcome back to a highlights video, uh, for the innovators mindset podcast for the month of July, 2021. Thanks. I, like, I, I think that some people hearing this might think, okay, this is great for the students who want to maybe go into a career similar to yours. But I actually think it's beneficial to every student because like one of the things that I've talked about forever, if every kid is getting Googled and we're constantly telling them, hey, don't do this stuff because, um, because if anyone finds anything negative of you, you're gonna lose opportunity. Where I'm saying, well, if everyone's Googling you and they find incredible stuff, then you're gonna actually be in an advantage. So like how, so how does what you're talking about actually benefit a student who's not 
necessarily going on to become a journalist or maybe do this as their main, you know, wants to do a career that doesn't necessarily have, and I, I don't want to say this as a focal point, but the main focal point, because like businesses know that if you want to, um, I, I don't know if you remember, if you ever saw the, the Dollar Shave Club, um, the Dollar hey, Shave Dollar Shave Club for men. For sure. Do you remember like the, there was like the first commercial that w went viral and it was so ridiculous that it actually basically started this business, but it was the, the business was around a razor, but it was, it was the video that got people like all of a sudden signing up to it. So I think that when you're looking at that, there's different elements of this too, but it's, this is what you're talking about is not just for the students who want to solely go into video creation, correct? Like absolutely, it, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It, it has nothing to do with a student wanting to be a journalist like I was mm -hmm. or be in the media profession. It has everything to do with transferable skills. We teach science. And to your point, I'm not mm -hmm. against science, but every child would not be a scientist, but it's about what they learn right. through going through the scientific process. We have sports. Certainly you and I would have, would have liked to be a professional athlete. And so many parents put their child in sports. Mm -hmm. A lot of them might feel like their child will be a professional athlete, but it's about the teamwork and it's about the work ethic. We have, you know, music and, and Spanish, but every child isn't going to be a pianist. It's about mm -hmm. the transferable skills that they learn through the video creation process. That's what I really hope that educators and specifically administrators take away from this. It's about the reading because you have to do research and read information and the research. It's about the writing, as you mentioned, whether it's just a skit or a video story, mm -hmm. before you do anything, you have to write it out. It's about the presenting. So many times when I work with young people, because I have a journalist background, I, I emphasize narration and voiceover. So, you know, what is your pacing like? What is your tone like? What is your projection? We need these communication mm -hmm. skills because there are still adults who have a fear of public speaking. Yes, there is technology in terms of editing and things of that nature, but it's not just about being a media professional or being a journalist. It's skills that they can use in anything. If you want to open up your own restaurant, mm -hmm. it will be good to know how to write videos to show case the food choices that you have if you want to open up a, a, a hair salon it will be good to show the different hairstyles that you can do through video and can write that and can film that and present that if you want to be a, a real estate agent and you want to showcase homes every single profession mm -hmm. a car dealership uh, uh, if you're in finance and business like every profession you're going to need to know how to create videos and need to know how to write and going back to the example of presenting again if you're uh, going to apply for a job and have an interview. You need to know how to present yourself and need to know how mm -hmm. to speak. So this really has nothing to do with being a journalist as I was of being a media professional is now taking technology, putting it in the classroom and, and changing the way that we teach students basic skills that is now more relevant and relatable to today's society, but it also has benefits that they can utilize in their mm -hmm. everyday life. I, I hope that comes across. I think that I was really afraid when I first started teaching. I wanted to, I, I wanted to look like I had all the answers, and I was really fearful if I didn't have all the answers that I would be judged. And I really wish that I had done a better job reaching out for help and resources, because I think that that would have made things easier. The more that I feel like I've connected with people. You know, and I stopped just closing my doors, the better teacher I think I became. And so back when I started, that was not the culture. Um, and so, but now it is. And I really hope I, if I had to give myself advice, it would be that you do not have to do this all by yourself. You know, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many things, there's so many opportunities out there. And it was really hard when I first started teaching. <laughs> what my mom and dad did for me and sacrifice for myself, my siblings to be able to do what I'm doing today. And they instilled in me this idea that your job is to ensure that things are better for your own kids, right? right. Like whatever yeah. you, whatever we gave you. And that's what they did for me, right? Like they, I had uh, so much of an easier time 
than my parents did because my parents made sure of that. Right. And it wasn't, we were like, you know, rich and had all this disposable income or things like that. But I think they instilled in me a lot of things that I take into being an administrator, being an educator, the importance of relationships. Like I always compare how they ran their restaurant to how I ran my school and what I learned from that experience. And so I, I, I think, the, the pride that you have when you talk about your family is, is something that resonates with me because it shows that you don't need formal education uh, to be a very intelligent person. You don't need, uh, there's a lot of things that we can learn from people that maybe didn't have the same path in education because let's be honest, they didn't have the opportunity that we did. And the reason we had that opportunity is because of our families, because of our parents. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about this. Like, what do you see um, in your work today that you think is influenced by your your parents uh, and their immigrant story? Like, what are some things that you look at that you do that you're like, yeah, this this is what my parents instilled in me. Like, what are some of those things? Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I was just, I had a conversation with my mom the other day. Mm-hmm. Man, I, I taught my mom how to FaceTime, George. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, that's a podcast in itself. <laughs> but, but, what I, what, what, but what I found was that my conversations with my mom are longer when I FaceTime with her than yeah. when I call her on the phone. Yeah. But I was thinking to myself, is my mom only had a sixth grade education back in the years of us. My father was a fourth grade education uh, because he had to go work to support the family. And my mom's situation was different because she was a woman. And I kept thinking to myself, is if my mom had the opportunity to be educated the way I was, she would have been a great leader. Mm-hmm. She's no nonsense. She tells it like it is. She's honest. She's sincere. She'll give you the shirt off her back, Mm -hmm. you know, and she works, she works very, very hard. And I'd like to think that I have some of those attributes Mm -hmm. of my mother. And I, and I believe I exhibit those, or at least I want to exhibit those every day that I come to work. And and she was a mill worker for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. Um, Really, really, I I cannot remember my parents, probably like you taking a sick day. Right. Right. With my father, he was a very soft spoken leader. He led more by example. Mm-hmm. When he did speak, you know, people listened and it took a lot. And I, I think I gained my, I have my father's patience and my mother's impatience. <laughs> my, my father was a very patient, patient, patient man. And it took a lot. It, it took a lot to upset him. And if you upset my father, then nine out of 10 times, you were, you were probably in the wrong, right, <laughs> so, right. so to speak. So I, I'd like to think that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a patient. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, my parents are both good listeners. Uh, and I think part of doing the work that we do, George, you, you got to be a good listener. It's one thing to be hearing, to, to be listening, but are you hearing people right. when, when they're talking? So, and again, I think it's mostly that work ethic. And also just the fact that I think I get my father's innovation, uh, being innovative mind. He worked in the mill and he was always being recognized for being efficient and for coming up with little, 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 always tinkering and making things and creating things to make the workflow more efficient as a machine operator. And, and my mother, was, my mother is just, you know, she's just a hard, honest yeah. worker. And she was, and the other piece that I think I get from both my parents and my mother was reminding me of this the other day. When times were tough in the in the mill where she worked, my mother was a seamstress, and she would if her hours were cut, can I clean bathrooms? Can I sweep floors? What can I do to make sure that I'm getting my full pay every week? Because any job is not above me, and I would never ask someone to do something I wouldn't do myself. And I've always felt um, I've always felt that as a leader that if I'm asking you to do something, it's because I would do it myself. From the work that I've read, not only, uh, you know, from your prior book, but from your blog, I think you both do that really well, is that you make it where like, oh, like that's, I can do that. You know what I mean? I think and I, like, is, is that like, is that something like if you take something like, like I'm going to get, put you on the spot here. Like what's like a complex thing that you've made simple that, you know, someone listening to that teaches grade five, you know, can do right away, like, and connect this. And I know that you can't like, Hey, just do this one thing. And you, you're, you, you're a project-based, you know, project-based 
certified, right? But like, what's like a simple idea that, you know, people can do right away? Yeah. So, so the idea is like a lot of times we have this idea and, and you've, you've written about this before, like mm-hmm. traditional practices, like yep. we, we vilify traditional practices as bad. And I think, I think, um, when we do that, um, we're not always respecting the work that came before us, but we're right. painting things in terms of like black and white. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times we do that with more progressive practices. Either you're doing like project based learning, genius hour design mm-hmm. thinking, or you're doing something else, which, which isn't as good. Right. right. Um, so it's this whole idea where a lot of times with inquiry based learning and project based learning, and I know we started out this way, we would look at that and say, this is wonderful. Our kids need to be learning through investigation and exploration. And anybody who's doing direct instruction, like that's right. terrible, right? right? Like there's no place for that. And, and of course, like the answer lies somewhere in between, cause it's not about us trying to be progressive. It's about <laughs> the needs of our students, right? right? So this whole idea of how might you infuse direct instruction into project-based learning. Mm-hmm. So, so to boil that down into something that you could easily wrap your head around, we uh, categorize direct instruction during project-based learning into three different categories, proactive, reactive, and learning detours. And proactive is like, you know, the majority of your kids are going to need this. Mm-hmm. So you're going to teach it ahead of time before the project itself or right before they're going to need it within the context of the project. Reactive is like, oh my gosh, like as I'm teaching this project, I have found that the majority of my students now need to learn this concept or skill or whatever mm-hmm. it might be. So now mm-hmm. I'm going to teach it, whether it's one-on-one, whether it's in small groups or whether it's class-wide. And then learning detours is basically when students take their project in different directions based on maybe their passions or interests or any phenomenon that they might bump into during the project. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the space. I'm going to give space to my students so they could explore those passions and interests and phenomenon rather than saying to them, no, sorry, that's not what we're doing. No time and place for that. So it's also like, I'll take it in the other direction. Like you said, sometimes we can make it complex. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've learned is that like, there's a difference between making something simple and then also like simplifying it, which is like dumbing it down. Right. 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 So you could take it in both directions. So we're also making sure that as we're communicating something like this, somebody um, with deep knowledge of PBL, hopefully won't be like, well, that's not true. Or you're taking something that really is important. And, and that, that, that's not right. Or, or that, that's just, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I think it could go in like both directions, but there's, there's an example right there that, um, that we often use and it's in the book as well. So when you, when you, okay. So when like someone listening to this and Aaron, I'll I'll ask you this question, someone listening to this, uh, they, they hear project-based learning and they say, oh, this is like a fad, right? Like, this is like, this is like the cool thing now, uh, this is going to be for whatever. And then we're either going to do something totally different or we're going to call it something else, but it's really kind of project-based learning, but like with a little tweak, you know, like how is this not just like a thing that we're doing now? And how is this like something, you know, like everything I think evolves over time, right? Like I, you know, I think the way that we look at, relationships with our students always been important, but the way that we connect with our students, especially people going in virtual spaces, how we connect online, those things evolve and we change them, but we, it's always the constant as relationships are important. So like, how do you see this as a constant, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now? How do, how do you look at that? Um, you know, with project based learning? Sure. So Ross is going to be super jealous because this is one of his favorite things to explain. Mm-hmm. So feel free to jump in if you think I'm not doing it justice, right. yeah, well, you know, <laughs> but essentially like, Project-based learning, it is a thing, right? Like we've now put a label on project-based learning, but what it is, is a series of best practices that have been put together in a context, like in a, in context. Right. So it's the, it's the concept of, um, all like these, these best practices. So providing direct instruction in small chunks within the context of your project. Right. Um, it is ensuring that there's collaboration. It is ensuring that kids are getting feedback. Um, so all of these things that should exist in mm-hmm. any class, because we know that they're what are good, what's good for kids, um, are all part of project-based learning. And it's just how you put them together. 
Uh, so they do have staying power. And I would also right. point to the fact that project-based learning was actually a term that was coined in the late 70s. So mm -hmm. it's already been around for a while. Um, I don't think it's going to, I think it's past its fad phase. Right. Um, just what's best. Be yourself is what I would give my first year teacher self uh, the advice. And it's, it's probably because, you know, when I came into education, I had an idea of what the role of a teacher was. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was, I felt sometimes like I was acting a part out. If I look back, I really was acting the role of a teacher. Um, so much so that I had a mentor teacher who told me, Hey, Marita, like, You've got teacher voice big time, so so ha, ha, you got to stop. You got to stop doing the teacher voice for the kids. I'm like, what? I, and my heart was broken because I thought I was just working so hard right. to reach the kids. But she's like, you just need to have a conversation with them. Here, here's a stool. Sit down on the stool and just talk and just relate and like be normal <laughs> about yourself. Like right? just just re relate in an authentic way. And that was really good advice. We, we can't, uh, you know, focus all our time on preparing students for something. Yeah. Right. Our role is actually to help students prepare themselves for anything. Right. Here comes the pandemic. Right. You know, and yeah. all of us had to live it and breathe it and be a part of being prepared for something that we weren't ever going to be prepared for. Yeah. And I think that's that to me is like a message not only for students, obviously, but educators, because you watch so many educators who adapted quickly, who figured things out. Uh, and I think sometimes we, we can easily get into the space. I like when I first started teaching, uh, it was all about how engaging I was as a teacher. Right. I, I, I tell the story often, right? Like I was so funny, just hilarious, such an easy person to listen to as a teacher. Kids could just say, they were like, I could listen to you all day. And they would do that little fake thing where they actually pretended they cared about my stories so that they could, you know, tell more. So we don't have to do stuff. And just, and I always say that at that point in my career, I was a really good speaker, not necessarily a good teacher. Those are two different things, right? And I remember those same kids would go to class the next year and they're like, oh, Mr. Cross, we like miss you so much. Like this teacher like makes us do things and like we have to figure out stuff. And, you know, we were like, you know, having to learn I'm like, oh, oh, like what have I done? Right. And it's like, it's, it's basically the teacher had expectations that they would figure out. And that's, that was like a really big shift for me. And I think, you know, you watch, uh, people that kind of excelled during this time were the ones who could figure out a pathway. Um, and it wasn't that they didn't lean on other people and it's not that, you know, uh, like that whole no, like, I don't think that you have to say like, Hey, I don't want to be an engaging teacher. And I always talk about it as like a continuum, right? It's not an either or, but it's, you know, ultimately you want kids to leave school, not needing us. Right. Because if they need us after they're in trouble. And I, I think that's a concern, not just in education, but, you know, maybe a little bit in society, too, in, in some ways. Because uh, you said about mentorship and asking people for something. And mm -hmm. I thought about something with this. Um, sometimes when we don't have good relationships, maybe with our administrator, kind of going back to the dark side. Right. Um, right. I think a lot of times we expect them to change and then we're just like, it's a lost cause. One of the best things that I've, um, I've done and I've encouraged people to do is when you sometimes don't have a good relationship, go ask that person for advice. Like you're, 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 you know, up on your traditional hierarchy of school because a lot of times the, the issue that maybe is happening that is, is being had is that that person doesn't feel valued. Looking back, I wish I would have been more comfortable asking questions and mm -hmm. maybe opening up a little bit more to some of my coworkers if I had questions. And how about you, Phil? What, what advice would you give to yourself? I think not to talk so darn loud. I just talk so loud. And uh, I hurt my throat over the years, and I don't know why. I just <laughs> like, are, you talk to, are you talking to students? Yeah, just anyone. I just like shout, but they're right next to me. So stop talking so loud. Most students or young people that do this anyway don't understand the power of media for mm -hmm. good. And with me having a journalism background, what I primarily teach is video stories. And these are stories that inform, that inspire, and impact. 
George, I know we're just on the same page because I know mm -hmm. one of your things is preparing students for the world and helping students change the world. Yep. It's so many Charlie D'Amelio's and prank videos mm -hmm. and dance videos and TikToks, but where are the positive, informational, inspirational videos? It's unrealistic to expect a student to take uh, media and really start to create informational videos or uh, inspirational videos without somebody showing them. So why do students need, why do schools need to do this? Because it's now giving students a different perspective on what they can do with the media. We hear so much about fake media, mm -hmm. but what about where are the students, where are the middle schoolers or the high schoolers that are, that are pushing out, creating and distributing positive messages. Right. If schools don't train students to do this, students won't just do this on their own. They'll do what they see their peers doing. And I understand it's a time and place awesome. for yep. everything. There's a place for fun and prank videos, but still one of the things I really try to emphasize is media is not just entertainment. It's also educational. And that's where the school comes in. I've said this forever is that grades do not tell the story of a child but we continuously try to tell the story only through grades to, for the next phase of their lives. And if you think about hiring practices, we often say, oh, what about grades? Well, I hired lots of people to work in school and never use grades, right? And so I think when we look at portfolios, we can create something much more holistic, much more uh, all encompassing of who our students are and not waiting for universities to ask us for this, but saying like, hey, this is something we're doing. This would probably be better to actually have an understanding of, you know, who's attending your school and who's getting into that space and, and creating something different, right? And it's just one example of things you can do. But when I was talking to Catelyn, I had shared this story about Roger Bannister. And for those of you who don't know Roger Bannister, uh, basically, he is the first person to break the four minute mile mark. And at the time, he was actually um, was striving to do this. And it was believed to be an impossible feat that nobody could ever break the four minute mile. In fact, um, from what I've been reading about it, people thought that if you ran that fast a mile, your heart would literally explode, that um, you would die because it was just too ridiculous. And he kept striving for this and people thought, you know, the conditions had to be perfect. And on a day, he actually had... Um, run the race conditions were it was cold it was wet from you know what i read obviously i didn't see the race it was a long time ago um but he broke the four minute mile and all of a sudden something that people believed was not possible all of a sudden was proven to be possible and when i talk about those practices in education i think sometimes people will say well we can't do this because of this and this and then and then somebody does it and then all of a sudden it becomes the norm it becomes a practice. And the Roger Bannister story is really interesting because uh, it actually was believed that he couldn't do it. He wouldn't be able to do this. And it actually, I'm reading this, it said 46 days uh, after Bannister's feet, John Landy, an Australian runner, not only broke the barrier again, um, but he did it even faster. So what was perceived as impossible, basically all throughout human history, than was possible by another person 46 days later. And it's actually at the point, uh, as I'm recording this, 11 high school students have actually broken the four minute mile barrier. So you see that once it is done, people now believe they can do it. <laughs>